Welcome to Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, the warehouse news, and everything happening in the cold jean world. Not only are there the coolest show in freight, but there's also Running on Ice, the newsletter that could not be colder. You can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Today, we welcome back the one and only Dana Krug, Senior Vice President of Cold Jean Fulfillment at Phenonic. Welcome back to the show, Dana. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. So, uh, we got great weather here in Kansas City, one of the best cities in the world. As you know, I mean, you are in the Kansas City, Kansas side, which is better than the Kansas City, Missouri. As a St. Louis girl, I it's, it's in my blood to dislike Kansas City, but it's all right. We'll let it slide for today. We all can't control where we live. That's right. All right. So we have the pleasure of welcoming you back on the show because last time we were talking um, about the actual like cool technology and um, the actual like, you know, tech that's in the phenonic totes that we talked about. Um, but yeah, I am excited because you have a little video to show us today. So I do. I've got a great video. You were excited about how we test products, right? And we talked a little bit about that in the last last uh, show. So I thought I'd bring just a really short clip here. Uh, I'm going to play that now. So that's the other technology, I'll say, old fashioned. That is our heat pump. The way that we've built this, um, it allows us to, um, you can kind of see a little bit of the geometric shape, right? Um, that that is uh, one of the kind of the helpful areas. Uh, the other really is about um, just the the metals that we use, the protection that we use, because I think, like I said in the last video that we did, or the last uh, show that we did, um, you can kind of see what that that older technology is very fragile. They they would actually break apart sometimes when they're trying to install them. And what we've done is build a, a casing around it. And then that's actually how we get our heat pumping power too. And then the geometry of how we build the encasing uh, allows us to get that sturdiness to where, like you said, we could run over it with a monster truck and have no problems. So uh, it's, it's um, I, I thought it'd be a good video to show you and, and uh, all your followers. First of all, I love watching things run over things. I don't know why, but it just makes me very happy. Like there was a time where people were putting watermelons under truck tires and I was like, this is where it's at. Like, this is amazing. Um, but I absolutely love that. I'm also starting to think that uh, the phenonic cooling systems, um, they were made with the same technology that the Nokia brick phones were made of, where you could literally do anything to them and they would not break. Very, very close. <laughs> I do remember the Nokia brick phones. I actually had one. So, well, uh, I I thank you very much for sharing that. That absolutely made my day. Um, I would like also for uh, a nomination for the future of the other random stuff that Phenonic has done to their heating things. Um, I think a good episode of Will It Blend is in the future. Maybe uh, against the hydraulic press. Um, pretty much all those like very satisfying videos of watching things get crushed. Well, we throw things off of roofs, drop them from drones. There you go. I mean, the honestly, the possibilities are endless. I actually just found out that that's like a whole industry of like people who like literally go and kind of get some type of, I forget what type of engineering it is, but there's literally people that like have an engineering degree and then their job is to just try to break stuff and like write it down. And I think it's the coolest job in the world. Um, and so I'm very jealous of people who get to do that for their job every day. Agreed. Agreed. So today we're kind of jumping away from the uh, cool tech behind it. Because last time I know we talked about it um, and just shy of, you know, tossing it in a blender and seeing what happens or needing it off a roof. Uh, I kind of want to hear about how the Phenonic customers are putting this cool technology into action. So kind of what is that true value that they're kind of unlocking by having this um, this this tote that has honestly some of the coolest technology. 
I, I think we walked through the technology. So here's the application. And, and you may have seen some of the press releases that we've done recently. Uh, we did uh, a deployment uh, with, with ShopRite, Wake Firm ShopRite uh, on the East Coast. And they had, um, I'll say, a very similar problem that most companies that are trying to do e-commerce fulfillment when grocery have. So their main issue was, one, no store was ever built to deal with e-commerce for grocery. They just, it didn't exist when they were built. So space was a pretty big concern for them. And if you can imagine their back rooms, very, very small. They're built just for their own uh, normal fulfillment that they do out to the floor. And they needed to be able to scale that business. So some of their stores could be doing five orders a day. Some of them could be doing 50. But as we've seen, e-commerce is growing three times the rate of in-store. So, so they had to have the ability to not only solve today's problem for space, but how do you scale that over time? So that was kind of one of their problems. The second problem that they had was you got you still have to get the food out to the curb in typically under five minutes. That's the time frame that everybody's trying to shoot for because after that amount of time, people start to get frustrated, right? So it's no longer, even though you, you're only taking five minutes to go to a grocery store, it's too long. <laughs> um, so what they've ended up doing is they said, hey, we'd like to get that cut down you know, by at least one, make sure that we can always hit it or get it cut down from there. So that, that was kind of another one that they needed to take care of. So, so labor side, we've, we've placed in a system that reduces their footprint by 50%, okay. uh, increases their capacity for throughput, um, gives them the ability to uh, maintain cold chain and document it. So if you can imagine now they have the ability as they're rolling the the totes out to the curb, the customer getting it has seen it go from, you know, in the store on the shelf, in a completely cold uh, container, out to the car and into their trunk, right? So they've they've been able to reduce their curbside delivery time by 70%. So they're more in the two, three-ish minutes now versus five, six minutes. So hitting their threshold of that under five blew it away. So, you know, when you look at that, you also look at staging time. We reduce their staging time. So that's everything that's going from the inside of the store onto the shelves, getting ready to go out the door. We reduce that by 50%. So big numbers. So in actual application with customers that are coming on board, they're seeing immediate results on this. And the beauty is, like I said, Mary, they, they have the ability with Wake Fern and ShopRite, they have the ability to, to actually start some stores at 10 orders a day, or maybe they've got certain stores that are already doing 50 or 100 a day. And the system just kind of scales up with them in the, in the space that's allocated. So it's kind of one big area that we're seeing the application. I absolutely love that because... Like you said, like depending on how that store handles their transactions, it literally could just be, I take it from the freezer, I scan it on whatever device I have, and then it goes straight into another cold container. So that way, you know, if I'm that worker and I'm picking four or five orders at a time, I don't have to worry. I don't have to kind of, you know, cut it off at a certain time so I can put all the frozen things and bag it and put it in a, in another, um, you know, vessel or another container. I can literally just keep it in there and say, okay, this is like, I might have five totes up top, but these are, this is for one order, this is for two, this is for whatever, or however they have it set up. To me, that seems like it would be so much, so much time saving there. And then also I can just stack them up. I don't have to have a wall of, you know, deep freezes or other kind of industrial freezers or refrigerators to keep things cold while I wait for people to pick it up. Yeah, it, it, it's working really, really well. And you kind of hit some of the areas so they can, instead of, Instead of picking throughout the day, right, as a man, or maybe they came in the night before, they have the ability, if they want, pick off hours, right? So take congestion out of the store. So you don't have to worry about the time that you pick in advance anymore. You can pick when it's, when you have labor that maybe that's extra to be able to do it, or maybe it's off hour that you want to do it. Get, get all that congestion that you see inside of your stores away. I think we've all seen it where you're 
you're in certain aisles, you've got four or five carts of employees that are kind of putting this stuff together. So, and you're kind of weaving in and out of them, right? So take that away, gives everybody a little bit better uh, shopping experience. And then we're also reducing their their carbon footprint. We talked a little bit about our our CO2 and water as our refrigerant. So from a sustainability perspective, we're actually lowering their carbon footprint uh, of, of ShopRite. And we're lowering the energy consumption at the same time. So it's uh, it's literally win, 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 win. I'm failing to see any downside at all in this. <laughs> Because I guess also they don't have to like plug in, they don't have to plug in the totes to charge them because that's uh, that that's what the whole, your guys' whole technology is. And you don't have to have a wall of deep freezes taking up space for in like your warehouse area. So that way you're not taking away the ability to store more inventory there. You don't have to retrofit. Like there's a grocery store by my house that has a lot of um, like in-store pickups or like an Instacart thing that they literally had to retrofit um their customer service area to they like took it all out like the counter they took it out and then just put like a wall of refrigerators and like um a bunch of racks for like dry goods they put that there um and now you just have to go up to like one of the random check stands that is customer service it's like attached to the self-checkout so it's one of those where it's like oh okay um that's kind of cool because also their customer service is like one of those places where you can like pay your utility bills so it's actually like a pretty busy customer service that they had to cut out to have this extra space. But if they could have just, you know, had to, had a stack of totes or had something else in the back where they didn't have to cut out this whole space, it would have saved them, you know, a lot of, probably a lot of time and money. Yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. And we've seen customers that want to put this in the front of the store. And it's part of that's just logistics of how their store is laid out. But again, even from that perspective, you know, you can put these in the front of the stores on our our carts that are powered, and you're not disrupting everything that you have in the front of the store to be able to do that. You're not taking as much space to be able to go do that, and you know, and it's quite honestly, it looks nicer. Um, so with that, what we, we set it up. Yeah, it's that you're looking for maybe a broom closet or a maintenance closet's worth of space instead of having to cut out an entire alcove. And it, and a lot of times the retailers are having to, I mean, you're saying that they cut down a, a customer service area. Uh, a lot of times they're cutting down, you know, merchandising areas where it's, it's pretty high margin uh, products that they're pulling off the shelf in order to make enough room for what ends up being, you know, a, a, a pretty labor intensive, you know, uh, costly process. So you're literally going from high margin, really good to, Hey, I'm kind of losing money on doing this, but I, I've got to do it. So, yeah. Cause I know there's other ones, uh, around us that like, they have that, like, um, what I like to call like the specials at the front. So usually it's like that seasonal, um, stuff of like, if it's football season, there's always Buffalo chicken dip when you first walk in or, um, in the summertime, there's like grill or there's like buns and chips and other things. It's kind of like rotate seasonally, but it's always what most of the time it always has what you look for to just, you know, it's that whole gets you buying right in the front. But if they have to cut that out for space for e-commerce, it's not always the most effective. So, um, so I guess how you touched on it a little bit, but I guess when it comes to like, if I'm a grocery store and I'm looking to, you know, really kind of enhance or not enhance, but cut down on my carbon footprint, I guess like is what, is there like a large scale swap that I can do to make this? Or is it really just truly kind of in fitting in that e-commerce grocery side of things? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So mainly I would say it's on the e-commerce side. Uh, we are, we are exploring kind of a larger wholesale swap of a store. But right now, that's we'll we'll kind of stick to the more of the e-commerce side, but but even on the e-commerce side, so just give you some numbers. So if we if we replace a hundred refrigerators, right, reach end refrigerator doors, right, um, with our totes, if they're refrigerators, we're going to save about twenty seven tons of CO two a year. If we do the same thing with freezers, it goes up to thirty six tons of CO two. So the, the savings, even though you don't, you're not kind of wholesale changing your whole store, you're addressing kind of the growth area of, of where you're adding more and more compressor systems that are out there. 
And what you're doing is really reducing your overall average carbon footprint because we're not adding anything really to the e-commerce side. We're a global warming potential of less than one. So that, as a reminder, compared to seven, eight, a thousand global warming potential with other refrigerants. First of all, that is absolutely wild. How this is completely random, and I don't know if you know the answer, but how many, like, met I guess tons of CO two does a does a average grocery store emit? Like, is it really that high? I don't know the answer. We can certainly follow up on exactly what it is, but yes, I mean, if you look at because I mean, if you're cut, if you're taking out like seventy to eighty thousand eighty. Uh, no, thousand. What was the numbers that you just said? Uh, twenty-seven tons for a hundred refrigerators. Yeah. So if you're taking out twenty-seven tons, that's not that's not a hundred percent. So I feel like that's a lot. It is. I mean, it really is. If you look at refrigeration and compressors in general, I are really the last the the next ground where everybody the activists are really going to start hitting hard. I mean, certainly regulation is coming in right now that's trying to to do that, right? But it's not it's not hard regulation to hit at this point. And, and uh, if you look at all of global warming potential across the earth, refrigeration is up there in the top couple. So it, it's a big deal. And for for the retailers to have something where we can come in and show them a really sustainable, reduced carbon footprint, you know, earth friendly, and it reduces their, their space that, you know, Better labor, it's it's a great win for the for everybody, including the consumer. Well, I also feel like because you touched on that labor thing and something that I just thought of, like if I'm that person working the like the the pickup section, and I you know probably have ten cars that show up at the same time. If I have to don't have to just keep walking back and forth to get everybody's order, or I can do it faster. Then that I'm not then me as that laborer, I'm not getting screamed at for someone having to sit there for six minutes or however long they feel that they have sat there for too long. Um, that I'm not getting screamed at, which means I'm less likely to go find another job if I'm not getting screamed at by people all the time. Or if someone's saying, Oh, well, like, you know, how do I know that my popsicles were kept cold or are they pre-melted? And um, because like I've gotten an S card delivery and my popsicles have been melted and I have not been happy about it, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> that's what I get for not going to store to pick it up. <laughs> but I just, I feel like that kind of all around is a solution that really, I feel, I, I'm really struggling to find any problems. Well, you're, you're hitting on some of the great things for the, for the associate, right? In the store, the employee that's doing all the picking. Add on top of that, think about, you know, a nice cold, dreary February where it's 40 degrees outside and it's raining. And then they go outside in the rain, they get wet, and then they come back inside. And then the old system, they had to walk into a walk-in freezer to go get the customer's frozen goods, right? And then they had to walk into the refrigerator and do it, um, and then go get their ambient, and they'll go do it again. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. Um, and I think that drives what you were saying. It drives turnover as well. And the turnover rate in e-commerce is pretty high. So giving the associate the ability to never have to walk into a refrigerator, never even having to open up the door of the refrigerator um, or freezer and then walking into the rain, it just, it's a better experience. I mean, it literally, that sounds like a fresh level of hell, being soaking wet, walking into a walk-in freezer. Like I'll tolerate it in the summer when I'm sweaty because it feels good. But in the winter time when I'm like cold and no, because then you're like cold in your bones and then you feel like nothing will get you warm except for a nice tropical beach vacation. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, so we are we are running out of time. But Dana, wow. I know uh, there's something that I have to ask you and uh, might be the hardest question that you get today. Are you ready for it? Ready. So we already know where you stand on cereal and soup. Uh, but I'm going to need your best cheesy dad joke. Best cheesy dad joke. It's like a pull from my my grandkids, actually. Yeah, Because no. they're the ones that laugh at it anymore. Um, yeah. So how about, uh, okay, here we go. So knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. 
Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. I think I know where this is going. <laughs> Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange. Glad I didn't say banana. <laughs> I. <laughs> that has been so long since I've heard that one. <laughs> I absolutely love it. It's a classic, though. It's such a classic. Because, of course, you can just get a kid to just, you can just keep saying banana as many times as you want. And they'll be like, what? What? Mm. I appreciate you for bringing back a classic. I like it. Thank you. So if someone wants to, uh, you know, pick your brain on the best dad-grandpa jokes, or uh, if they have any questions kind of about, the totes or anything like that, where can they find you guys outside the show? So they can certainly go to phenotic.com uh, and they can uh, kind of browse our website and it walks through a lot of applications. I'll actually be at Modex in Atlanta in March uh, and we're in several partner booths there that you can certainly look us up uh, at the show. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, you can either slide into Dana's DMs or just say hi to him in person. And if you do, I dare you to ask him the banana knock knock jokes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dana. Thanks, Mary. Always enjo enjoyable. You can catch other episodes of Running on Ice right here on Freight Waves TV or YouTube or anywhere else you get your podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Think about Running on Ice news? No sweat. Subscribe to the newsletter on FreightWaves.com slash Running on Ice. See you on the internet. <laughs>